to zoom. Okay, done. Well, in any case, let's uh, let's start over if it's okay for everyone. Mm -hmm. So our next speaker today is uh, Christina Goldschmidt, who's going to talk to us about the scaling limit of critical random directed graphs. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to see so many friends here. Um, Thanks very much to the organizers for organizing such a lovely meeting. Um, I feel like I owe everybody an apology. This is now work which is slightly old. Um, one of the effects of the last 18 months has been that I haven't had a huge amount of time for new research. So I hope you'll bear with me and that those of you who've already seen me speak about this will take it just as an opportunity for a bit of a break. Anyway, um, I'm going to see if I can get the chat open because I assume that things are happening. All oh, right, okay. Um, Bastian, if you let me know if there are any questions, that would be great. Yeah, sure, no problem. So uh, this is joint work uh, with Robin Stevenson, who's now at Sheffield. Um, I've given you the archive reference down there, which tells you a little bit about how old it is. Um, so let me see if I can go forward. Right, there we go. So um, I'm going to be thinking about the simplest model of a random directed graph. So let me call that DNP. So this is a graph on vertices which are labeled by one up to n, just as in Luigi's talk, and in which here each of the n times n minus one possible directed edges is present independently with probability p and absent otherwise. So the simplest model you could think of. So in this talk, I'm going to be concentrating on the strongly connected components of this graph. So just to define that, this is the collection of maximal subgraphs, which is such that for any pair U and V of vertices in the same subgraph, there's a directed path from U to V and a directed path back from V to U. And if for a particular U, it has no such V, then I'm just going to think about the singleton U to be a strongly connected component on its own. So that the strongly connected components are going to partition the vertex sets but not in general the edge set. So let me just give you a quick example. So here I've picked out in different colors the strongly connected components of this graph. And you can see that, for example, this edge is not involved in any strongly connected components. So here's a strongly connected component. I can cycle around and reach every vertex from every other one and back the other way. And similarly in each of these ones. And you can see that there are some singles and strongly connected components here. So hopefully the idea is clear. So there's an analog of this that I think probably everybody in this room is, is well aware of, which is the usual erdos rinne random graph, so where you have undirected edges, and so we normally call that GNP. So in that case, each of the n choose two possible undirected edges is present independently with probability p. And that model undergoes a very well-known phase transition, so let me just remind you what that does. So you take the probability that a particular edge is present p to be like c on n, possibly plus some smaller order term, for some fixed constant c greater than or equal to zero. And then if that constant is less than one, the components are all microscopic in size, so they're small compared to the number of vertices in the, in the graph. And if c is bigger than one, then there's a unique component occupying a positive proportion of the vertices and all of the other components are macros uh, microscopic in size. And one can zoom in on the critical point of this phase transition, so if you zoom in on P equals one on N. Indeed, you can add a little jiggle here, which is like lambda on N to the four thirds um, for some fixed lambda in the reals. And in that regime, the largest component is on the order of N to the two thirds. So this is sort of intermediate size scaling, whereby in fact, you've got a collection of largest components on the same order N to the two thirds, um, which are somehow going to join together effectively to become this giant component sort of slightly higher, for slightly higher p. So this lambda parameter is going to parameterize the so-called critical window for this erdos renyi model. And so we wanted to look at the analog of this sort of result for the directed case. So DNP undergoes, if you like, the same phase transition, although let me just observe in a moment that it's not quite the same. So if I take again my edge probability, so now this is a probability that a directed edge is present to be C on N plus potentially a lower order term, then if that C is less than one, all of the strongly connected components are microscopic. And if C is bigger than one, then there's a unique strongly connected component occupying a positive proportion of the vertices. So again, there's a giant strongly connected component now and all other strongly connected components are microscopic. So, so far so similar to the erdos case, but let me just observe that this isn't really quite the same thing. 
if you think about sort of putting on a set of glasses where you can't see the directions of the edges, we've actually got twice the edge density here. <laughs> right? So we've got a lot more edges hanging around. And what I would like to argue in a moment is that actually the phase transition that's occurring in this model is a bit more like the emergence of cycles in Erdős-Rényi rather than the emergence of a giant component. So the strongly connected components have much more kind of similarity to the cycle structure of the Erdős-Rényi random graph rather than the component structure. So let me just zoom in a little bit. So Wuchak and Sayastad in 2009 proved a sort of slightly more refined version of this phase transition result. So they said, let's take P to be one on N, but now let's give ourselves a sort of jiggle, which is epsilon N on N to the four thirds. And the epsilon N is either going to have to tend to plus infinity or to minus infinity. So this is a more refined version of the previous result. And we see this kind of separation of sizes occurring. So if epsilon N goes to plus infinity, then we see something on the order of epsilon n squared n to the one third. And if epsilon n goes to minus infinity, then we see n to the one third on epsilon n. So I'm going to concentrate on the critical window, which is precisely the phase where you're not allowed to plug in the value of epsilon n. So I'd like to plug in epsilon n as a constant, and that's explicitly excluded from this theorem. But let's do it anyway, just to get an idea of what should be the case. So if I plug in a constant, then my largest and second largest strongly connected components here are on the order of n to the one third, and that's also the case in this setting here. So we should be expecting critical components of size on the order of n to the one third. So let me emphasize that's different from the Erdős-Rényi undirected case where we had critical components on the order of n to the two thirds. So um, I should also mention a paper of Matthew Coulson from 2019, who showed that the size of the largest strongly connected component is indeed tight when rescaled by n to the minus one third. So that suggests that n to the one third is the right scaling here. And we, in fact, prove a scaling limit. So we take the ordered sequence of components, we rescale them by n to the minus one third, and we obtain a nice continuum limit object. And so the aim of this talk is to show you how that arises and to tell you a little bit about that continuum limit object. So since I'm going to rescale, I'm going to need to give you a continuum notion of a directed graph. And in fact, it's going to be useful to have a continuum notion of a directed multigraph. So a directed multigraph is a triple. So it's a vertex set, an edge set, and a function which is going to relate the two. So V and E are finite. R is a function from the edge set into pairs of vertices, which works like this. So for an edge E, R1 of E is going to be its tail, and R2 of E is going to be its head. So an edge is directed from its tail to its head. Okay, so here's an example of two edges which are both directed from U to V. And so they have the same tail and head respectively. So this enables us to neatly encode having multiple edges between the same pair of vertices, for example. And then we can also encode very easily the loop idea, so where the head and tail are simply the same. So I hope that the, the formalism is, is reasonably clear. So I'm going to call a metric directed multigraph a four tuple where the first three elements are just giving me my directed multigraph. And then the fourth element L is a function from the edge set into the positive reals, which is just assigning each edge a length. And we're going to have a, a special symbol. So this factor L is just going to denote the degenerate case of a loop of length zero. We sort of need something like that in order to complete our space. OK, so one thing that's hopefully straightforward is that the notion of strong connectivity carries over to these settings. So I don't really care about edge lengths where strong connectivity is concerned. And so I can just use my usual notion. Okay. So let me state the main result. So let's take the strongly connected components of our digraph DNP which in a moment I'm going to take P to be in this critical window or in what would have been the critical window for, for Edith Renyi likewise. And I'm going to think of this as a sequence of metric directed multigraphs by whenever I see a, a path of length K of degree two vertices, I'm going to think about sort of contracting them and just having a single edge of length K. So that's a sort of reasonably standard contraction to make. Okay, in the case of a loop, I'm going to leave a single vertex because I would like to always have a vertex to play with. And then I'm just going to complete that list with an infinite sequence of copies of this loop of length zero. Okay, and then just one more little bit of shorthand. If I've got a metric dimension multigraph X and some real number, I'm just going to write A times X for the same 
directed multigraph, but with the lengths all multiplied by A. So then that allows me to state our theorem. So suppose I take a P which is in this critical window. So it's one on N plus potentially a jiggle, which is lambda N to the minus four thirds. So then there exists a sequence of random, strongly connected metric directed multigraphs such that, in fact, each is either three regular or a loop. So what do I mean by three regular? I mean, it either has each vertex having two in edges and one out edge or two out edges and one in edge. Okay. And such that if I take the, um, the strongly connected components of my original graph and I rescale everything by n to the one third, then I get convergence and distribution to this sequence of random MDMs. So that's quite a lot to take in in one go. So I'm just going to pause there so that people have a chance to read. So I haven't really told you what the sense of this convergence is, and I haven't told you anything about the limit objects. So for the moment, I expect this looks a little bit obscure. But let me just say that, so we have a scaling limit theorem for all of the, the strongly connected components of this critical random digraph. Um, and we've got some nice description of the limit or hopefully reasonably nice description of the limit. So let me first say what I mean by the sense of this convergence. So if I've got two metric directed multigraphs, so X and X primed, then I'm going to say isom X, X primed is going to be the set of graph isomorphisms from one to the other. So what do I mean by that? I think the convenient way to set this up is to take a pair of bijections, one between the vertex sets, and the another between the edge sets, such that those two bijections kind of respect the grammar of the multigraph. What do I mean by that? I mean that if I have an edge over here on the left and it maps to a different edge over here on the right, it should be the same. It should be that the head and the, sorry, the tail and the head of each of those edges maps to the right place. So the tail here maps to the tail and the head maps to the head. Okay. So you can see that in this particular case, so I've got the same form for the underlying multigraph, but I have a choice about what I do with E2 and E3. I can either send E2 to E2 primed, or I can send it to E3 primed. Okay, so there are two choices for the graph isomorphisms here. Okay. So for my distance between two MDMs, I'm going to require something quite strong. I'm going to require that I have precise isomorphism between my graph structures. And then I'm going to ask, what is the largest difference in length between two edges under that isomorphism? Okay, so I'm going to require the same graph structure and I'm going to ask for the distance, what's the longest distance sort of distortion between that isomorphism. So in particular, X and X prime will be infinite distance if they're not isomorphic. Okay, and then for a sequence of MDMs or two sequences of MDMs, I'm going to say that the distance between them is the sum of the distances between their coordinates. And remember that I'm going to list things in decreasing order of size for definiteness. Okay, so the sense of this convergence is going to be with respect to this rather strong thing here called dist. Okay, and so, if I restate the theorem with respect to, to this disk thing, I'm going to observe that the limit object actually has finite total length here. So we've really got something that's sort of um, just on the order of n to the two, two uh, n, oh, sorry, uh, a thing which is on the order of n to the one third, and which has in the limit just finite total length. It's got countably infinitely many components, but they have their length sum. Okay. So I suspect for the moment, this is all a little, little bit obscure. And what I want to do is by sort of telling you something about how we go about proving this, give you some idea of um, what the limit object actually looks like. So there are several linear time algorithms for finding strongly connected components in a digraph. Um, and I'm going to use a variant of Tarjan's algorithm. So let me first go through this for an arbitrary digraph, which just has vertex set N. And the first thing I'm going to do is a first sort of algorithmic pass through this digraph, which is going to extract a directed forest, which spans the vertex set. So let me do this on an example. So here's my um, directed graph. And I'm going to start from the lowest labeled vertex. 
And anybody who's seen me talk about Eritrean type things will probably find what I'm about to say quite familiar. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a depth first search of this object using only out edges. So the first thing I'm going to do is look for the out neighbors of the vertex one. There are two of those, five and 17. So I'm going to reveal those out neighbors, and I'm going to show you that I've done that by coloring the edges red. And I'm going to move to the lowest labeled of those out neighbors. And I'm going to keep 17 on a stack for consideration later. And now I'm going to do the same thing again. So I'm going to explore the out neighbors of the vertex five. That's just two. Okay, and I'm going to move to two because it's the lowest labeled one. So 17 is still sticking our stack for later consideration. So two has no out neighbors that we haven't already observed. So there is this edge here, but I already am aware of 17. So I'm not going to think of 17 as being a child of two. Okay, so in fact, two has no new out neighbors that we haven't already seen. So I'm just going to move back to whatever's on the top of the stack and that's 17 at the moment. And again, 17 has no unseen out neighbors. It does have the out neighbor one, but we've already observed one. And in this way, so I'm again, whenever I get stuck, I'm going to move to the next lowest labeled vertex I haven't seen. And in this way, what I'm going to do is just pick out a collection of trees which span my vertex set. So here, three, I've got out neighbors, eight, 10, 15, I move to the lowest labeled, 10 and 15 sit on a stack for later consideration, and so on and so forth. So you can see that I'm just gradually picking out, in this case, three trees. Okay, so let's let FD be the directed forest that we just found. So one nice thing that this procedure does is it gives an ordering of the vertices, and in particular, the edges of my forest are all increasing for that ordering. So I'm going to think of this as way, a way of sort of providing a planar ordering of this forest. So let me split the edges of this um, digraph up into three categories now. So I've got the red edges, which were the edges of the forest that I just picked out. And then I've got two other sorts. I've got orange ones which are increasing for this planar ordering. So I've relabeled my vertices using this planar ordering in which we, we just explored the, the forest. The orange edges are increasing for the ordering, but not necessary for the trees. Right? So these are surplus edges. They're in addition to the trees that we, we picked out. And then there were the blue edges, which are decreasing for the planar ordering. And so we're going to call them back edges or backward edges. Okay, and it turns out that this classification of the edges into three sets is really very useful for analysis. Um, okay, so here are the strongly connected components of this particular graph. And let me remove any edges that weren't useful for them. So you can see that some of these edges aren't playing any particular role in creating the strongly connected components and some others are. Let me just make some observations. So any non-singleton strongly connected component needs to have at least one forward edge and at least one backwards edge. Otherwise, there's not going to be any way of creating the cycles that we need in order to be strongly connected. And each strongly connected component is contained within a single tree of this directed forest. Since there are no forward edges by definition between different trees. Okay. On the other hand, and we see it in the picture here, one such tree can contain multiple strongly connected components. Okay, so Given the directed spanning forest, so given the red edges, the surplus edges can go from a vertex to anything that's sitting on the stack at the time that that vertex is explored. Let's not worry about the surplus edges. They turn out not to actually play any significant role in the limit. But what is important is the back edges may go from a vertex VJ to any earlier vertex in the ordering. Okay. So, to find the strongly connected components, not all back edges are going to matter. And I want to put some particular emphasis on the role played by so-called ancestral back edges. So those are ones which point to an ancestor in this forest. So let me just do this on a picture because I think it's easier to see. So if there are only non-ancestral back edges, then there are no non-trivial strongly connected components. So this is a non-ancestral back edge. It's pointing from a vertex to an earlier vertex, vertex in the order, but it's not creating a cycle. It's not creating a directed cycle. But on the other hand, this one does. So this is an ancestral back edge. It's going from V3 to one of its ancestors, V1, and that creates a directed cycle, which automatically gives me a non-trivial strongly connected component. And as soon as one of those is present, 
actually other back edges can kind of piggyback off it. So here's an example of uh, a directed edge, which on its own wouldn't create a strongly connected component, but in concert with this one can do so. Okay, so this now adds in V6 into this strongly connected component here. Okay, I'm just going to skip past the surplus edges because I'm a little bit short on time. So how do we go about finding the strongly connected components? I'm essentially going to do a sort of second pass using the same vertex ordering that I did in my first pass through to find this forest. And what we need to keep track of is a so-called active set of vertices. So this is going to be a set of vertices to which if I make a connection, I'm going to create or add to a strongly connected component. And so this just involves thinking about what's ancestral to, to stuff that we've got already. So my active set is going to be empty at the start, and I'm going to use the same exploration order. So I now go to A1. Now, if I were to have an edge from V1 to V0, that would create me a strongly connected component. So V0 is part of my active set. Okay, and I keep adding to the active set until bang, I see one of these back edges turn up. So my active set is now consisting of these three vertices at this stage, and I connect into it, and that creates a strongly connected component. And I keep adding until this point where I observe that I have no connection from V4. And when I leave V4, I'm going to go to V5, and it's no longer possible for this to be involved in a strongly connected component henceforth. So I can output a singleton strongly connected component on V4. I'm done with V4 for the rest of time. On the other hand, this stuff for the moment is still potentially connectable to. And in this way, if one goes through and carefully considers what one might connect to in order to make a strongly connected component, one keeps track of this active set. Okay, and it slightly depends on, so it would now be the case that I can't make a strongly connected component by connecting over here. Oops, let me go back, because I've got these two edges which conspire against me. So once I've left a subtree, I can no longer usefully create um, back edges into it as an active set. And so I've output here, strongly connected component on all of these vertices. Okay, so if I continue through to the end of the tree, I then get to all of the strongly connected components. So the point is that assuming there are no surplus edges, the only back edges which count are those which go from the current vertex at some step into whatever the current active set is. And if there are surplus edges, I need to take them into account and do something similar, but that's not going to turn out to matter. And the important point here is that the distribution of this directed forest is actually exactly the same as it would be if I did the same exploration, but instead on the undirected Erlisherin land and graph. And so in particular, that forest is something we understand very well. And then what's nice is that the possible surplus or back edges are then just present independently, each with positive uh, with, po with probability P. And so I can think of that as just an extra layer of noise that I put on top of the forest that I've already found. So I'm aware that I'm pretty much out of time. So let me just quickly say something about this forest. So the forest of trees in the scaling limit turns out to be encoded by the excursions above zero of a drifted, sorry, a, a Brownian motion with a parabolic drift, which is reflected at its running minimum. So these are sort of Brownian continuum tree-like objects. So they're, they're absolutely continuous with respect to the law of the, the Brownian continuum random tree. And the correct scaling is that the trees have into the two thirds vertices and heights or distances on the order of n to the one third. And an important point is that that means that a single large tree in this forest is going to be on the order of n to the two thirds in size. So that means that there are n to the four thirds possible back edges, each of which is present independently with probability about one on n. And so one of the large trees is typically going to contain all the n to the one third back edges. There's no way one can possibly control that as n goes to infinity. And so it's really important to do this reduction whereby one thinks about which back edges can possibly make a difference. So the ancestral ones can go from the current vertex to any ancestor, and that's a nicely controllable process in the limit. Those ancestral back edges are just arising according to a Poisson point process with a finite intensity. And the full process of back edges, which matter is a rather more complicated thing, but you can come up with a continuum analog of this active set, which is such that the intensity at which one creates 
these important back edges is finite at all times. And so that means they really are just occurring as a Poisson point process with finite rate. Um, I'm going to skip past those the surplus edges. But this is sort of the picture then to have in mind at the end. We've got one of these trees in the forest with just certain bits picked out by important back edges. And so really what we get down to is a rather simple object. So the, the trees in my forest were Brownian continuum like tree things, you know, fractal objects with a very complicated structure. But all I've done is just pick out a sort of finite subtree consisting of finitely many directed line segments plus these sort of back edges that matter. And I hope you can imagine sort of folding these things round in order to create directed cycles, which are really just going to be what my final components look like. So these are the sort of final strongly connected components in this object. So I'm very much over time, so I'm going to draw to a close. Um, I just want to observe that this isn't just specific to the directed Erdős-Renyi random graph model. So these re results turn out to be universal in the sense that they can also be shown to hold for certain critical directed configuration models. So that gives you a much broader class of, of models to look at. And in particular, my students, Sáter Dondervinkel, who you've already heard of, and Nang Nang Xie have um, recently put up a, a preprint in which they show uh, such a universality result. Um, so that seems like a good place to stop. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your talk. So I think we have uh, time for, for one, one question, maybe a couple, if they are quick. I'll try to look at the chat in case anybody wants to type them. Well, if there are, I, I, I can ask a, a quick question maybe. So is, is it possible to, to work with like um, a multi-type version of the directed data when you're in the graph where you, you would put like some edges with uh, a, a parameter lambda that is slightly bigger or slightly smaller and break out of this universality class? Goodness. Um, oh, sorry. I don't know. I mean, that's an intriguing question. Um, I mean, certainly, a, a perhaps more obvious way to break out of this universality class is to try to end up with an underlying tree structure, which is heavy tailed rather than having sort of Brownian type tree structure underneath. And, and that's certainly one can do. And I think um, Setter and Nang Nang between them will, will study some of those cases, I think, in, in sort of the coming months. Um, I think one could certainly imagine trying to come up with some sort of multi-type version of this model, but sort of on the spot, I don't know exactly what it would do, but uh, I think that's a very interesting question. Thanks, Dustin. Thanks. Uh, is there some more question? Well, if not, then let's thanks again, Christina, for a, a very nice talk. So you can unmute yourself if you wish. And so now we go to our next, next speaker, uh, which is uh, Alice uh, Caligaro. So Alice, maybe can you share your screen? Yes. Um, okay. I can't do full screen for some reason. Oh, okay. Uh, have Do you, you see full screen now? Yeah, it works perfectly. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, good. So next speaker is uh, Alice Caligaro, which will talk about a specially dependent fragmentation model. Thanks. Thank you for the introduction and thank you also for the invitation and giving me the opportunity of presenting my work. Uh, so this talk is based on, on a joint work with Matt Roberts, who was my PhD supervisor in Bath and I completed my PhD at the University of Bath. So I'm going to talk about a fragmentation model where the rates at which the pieces fragment depend on their shape, which can also be viewed as a branching random walk where the rates depend on the particles positions, but we will see more about this equivalence later. Now, let me say that our goal is to determine the growth rates of the number of particles in either one of these systems. And I will focus on the proof of this result and on the most um, technical aspects on the proof, which can be summarized as the following. So first of all, we need to work in a very technical setting, 
in the sense that um, when we work in our function space, the functions will be discontinuous and we will use the Lagi metric, which is even weaker than the usual Schorhoff metric. Then because in our branching random walk, the rates depend on the particles positions, we won't have large deviation estimates available right away. So we'll need to extend those that already exist in the literature and we will do this by with the coupling method. And then um, we have, um, we, we have an even unfriendlier setting because the way in which the rates depend on the particles position is such a way is such that um, the rate is discontinuous at the origin, and this will make it difficult to control how the system grows at small times. But first of all, let me start with the definition of our fragmentation process. We start from the unit square and we define a branching rate for every rectangle of base B and height H as the function R of B H. So what happens is that every, every square splits at rate one, which is the lowest possible rate. And then th this function is unbounded above. So for every rectangle, the longer and thinner it is, the, the faster it splits. Then we also define the probability of splitting around the horizontal component, which is given by the function P, which again depends on B and H in a similar flavor. So we, we say that every rectangle splits faster along its longest edge. So for example, if P is longer than H, then we choose to split along the base with a probability which is close to one. So we reduce the base. And in the opposite case, if the base is much smaller than the height, we choose to split along the base with small probability close to zero, and therefore we reduce the height. Of course, if we don't split along the base, we split along the height. So that happens with probability one minus P. And what happens with squares is that we choose with probability a half to split in either direction. Then once we have chosen in which direction we want to split, the point at which the crack occurs is chosen uniformly along the selected edge. So what happens is that when we start from the unit square, after a time which is exponentially distributed with mean one, the square will choose with probability a half to split either horizontally or vertically. And the point will be chosen uniformly along the edge we've selected, which in this case is the base. And then we create two rectangles. Now, each one of these breaks again independently one of the other and using the same rules we've just described. So let's say the rectangle on the left splits first this way, and then we keep going and we obtain a fragmentation of the unit square. The important property here is that when a crack propagates, it does so only until it hits the boundaries of one of the existing rectangles. So this is important because it gives us a branching property in the sense that what happens within one rectangle is independent of what happens on the outside. So um, this is the evolution of the system with time where red and green colors are assigned to somehow um, exceptional shapes. So when rectangles are very, very long or very tall, whereas the yellowish, yellowish um, shades should correspond to squares, which are of course the preferred shape in the sense that as soon as a rectangle is very long and thin, with high probability it splits very fast and it reduces its longest side. So we expect to see more squares than other shapes. So what we're interested in is um, when we look at the configuration at large times, for example, this one, and we fix a particular shape, then how many rectangles are there with that particular shape? And also how does their evolution like? So how did rectangles get there? How did they split? Did they stay squares for a long time and then suddenly with a few splits get to that rectangle or did they split fast and get long and thin? So we want to see how that path to the selected shape looks like. Let me also um, uh, talk about the, a comparison of our model with a, with a constant rate case. So on the, the right hand side, you can see the, the configuration that we can obtain at large times uh, for our model where um, the rates at which rectangles fragment depend on their shape and we reduce long and thin rectangles. And on the left hand side, you see what happens when every rectangle splits at rate one and chooses with probability a half to split either vertically or horizontally. So you see that there's a lot of long and thin rectangles on the left hand side. And somehow 
um, that model with constant rates is is trivial compared to ours because when the rates are constant and the probabilities are constant, you can just encode your fragmentation as a general branching bound book. And, and this gives you also that the two components will be independent because the base and the heights are two processes that split at constant rates. They're totally independent one of the other. Whereas for us, both base and height contribute to determine the rate at which you split. So you have to keep track of both. Somehow, though, the model on the left hand side is much more friendlier from a mathematical point of view. So I want to briefly mention that it has been considered by Bolchezan and Hambly, which is a group that has been formed in Oxford. And they've been interested in this model, particularly on the, on the applied point of view, because um, it resembles some configurations that are, have been observed in the molecules of crystals. And for this re reason that it can be treated as mathematically as a general branching round walk, they can also consider a bunch of different questions. For example, they can determine how many fragments have one of the edges, which is, is longer than a threshold, which in our setting is a much more complicated question. So um, what we do to treat our model is, is still um, build an equivalent branching round walk. And this is done in a standard way by taking a minus log transform. So what happens is that if the fragmentation starts from the unit square, we get a branching round walk in R2, which starts from the origin and which has two components, X and Y, which are minus the log of the base and minus the log of the height of every rectangle. And then we define R and P to be our branching rate and probability of jumping in the horizontal direction, which, has, which are the same functions as above, where I've just replaced um, B and H with X and Y. So um, we see that this is somehow the model we've introduced is, is interesting, both from a fragmentation processes point of view and from a branching round walks point of view, in the sense that in the fragmentation process, um, we let the rate depend on the shape of the fragments, which is new. It's been done sometimes uh, for multi-type fragmentations, for example, but then the shape has only been allowed to vary in a finite set. Whereas for us, the shape can take a continuum of possibilities and it's even an uncountable set. Um, and when we translate this into a branching round walk, of course, the rates depend on the particles positions. And this is basically uh, one of the directions that research on branching systems has been focusing on in the last few years. So from now on, I will only speak about the branching round walks. So only the variables X and Y will appear from now until the end of the talk. So we, we introduce a rescaling. So for a fixed large time, we rescale the paths of all the particles by a factor T in both space and time. So this is the standard large deviation regimes. But we, we already see that this um, causes many problems. So for example, the functions that I've um, introduced in the previous slide, which are the rate and probability of splitting in either direction, after this rescaling are essentially governed by the ratio of the two components. So these R star and P star are just the functions from the previous slide without the plus ones, which disappear under the rescaling when big T tends to infinity. Um, and, and this uh, causes problems, first of all, because both these functions are unbounded both, but this is somehow easier to deal with. But the main problem is that they're discontinuous at zero. And this is what will make controlling the system at small times difficult. Now, another problem that arises with this transformation is that is in the, in the jump distribution. So in the fragmentation process, we choose the point at which we break uniformly along the edge. And after the minus log transformation, this becomes an exponential of parameter one, which is outside the strong Kramer regime for large deviations. So this causes many problems. First of all, we need to consider a space of discontinuous functions. So E will be our function set, which is the set of Cadillac functions. A, a good point is that they're non-decreasing because the exponential distribution is always positive. Uh, a downside is that the Schorhot metric is not strong enough because with this metric, E is not compact. So we need to consider a weaker topology which is the one um, introduced by the Levy metric, which is defined here at the bottom of the slide. 
Now this is getting rather technical. So I just want to say that with the Levy metric, uh, the distance between the two functions f and g is quantified in terms of their graphs. So basically we look at the graphs of f and g as curves in R2, where at these continuities, you just join the points with a vertical segment. And we say that f and g are close if their graphs are, are, are close in R2. Okay, so our theorem is the following. Uh, we, we define nt of t for a given function set d to be the set of particles whose rescaled path looks like a function in this set. And we want to determine how this, uh, the cardinality of this system grows when t is large. So our result holds almost surely. And this number grows as the supremum of a functional k, which I'm not explicitly defining here because I want to go through the proof somehow step by step. So this, its definition will appear in the next few slides. Uh, the important takeaway message from this slide is that um, the condition to have this theorem holding almost shortly is that k stays positive at all times up to the final one. So uh, this is somehow a non-extinction condition in the sense that it's requiring that there are always particles following the path f for all times. I see a question. Uh, little f is a macroscopic, uh, no, little f is after the rescaling. I, I don't hear anything, is that normal? Well, I didn't say anything, so. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, 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 so, 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 um, so, so, so you're talking about large deviations, so uh, uh, I understand that you, you look at the trajectory of uh, one side of a rectangle in time and uh, then after rescaling, so um, you, F... both. So F F has two components. Right. Oh, it has two components. Yeah. I see. And Z okay. is the process right. X and Y, so right. it's a branching random walk in R two, and F has two components. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have to process a little bit more. Um, don't want to stop you. Okay. So um, the plan for, for the rest of the talk is focusing on the building blocks of the proof. So the first thing we do is um, getting rid of paths that particles are too unlikely to follow or restricting ourselves to good paths. A good definition of good paths for us is particles that lie within this cone so that, that are between two straight lines where we think of M to be a large constant. So this is a good definition because within this cone, the rate functions along both components, so I'm thinking of Rx to be R times P, the rate along the X component, and Ry to be R times y minus P, one minus P, so the rate along the Y component. So these rates are basically the ratio of the two components and um, within functions in the cone will be bounded. Now, forgive me for introducing some more notation. There are no particles in this cone because all particles for a while would be, all the particles would be, would be zero for a while. So uh, GMT only extends this cone of a tiny bit, which tends to zero with big T. But the point is that we can show that there are no particles outside this light modification of the cone. So the particles are there with exponentially small probability. And then within this set GMT, we can show that it is totally bounded. So we can cover it with finitely many balls in the Levy metric around nice functions. So functions that are good paths in GM and that are, that, and that are also piecewise linear. So the, the moral of this slide is we can forget about particles outside the cone because those paths have exponentially small probability. And within the cone, I can restrict to open balls centered around really nice functions. So functions along which the rate is bounded and that are piecewise linear. So I can uh, look at the expected number of particles that stay near one of these functions. Now, this, the steps to, to calculate this, so we can, of course, apply the many to one lemma, which reduces to only one particle. 
And somehow this also tells us that we're looking at the right event. So the event that one trajectory is near a function means that the rate evaluated along that path is almost deterministic. So this exponential of the integral of the rate will be almost like the exponential of the integral of R evaluated at F. So this deterministic term, which represents how many particles are growing along F, can exit the expectation and we're left with the probability that a single path stays near F. Of course, this path still has rates that depend on, on its position. So this is where we need to be able to estimate this probability. And this is not already given in usual large deviation results because the rate is not constant. So, um, so the way we, we, we calculate this probability is by building a coupling, which I want to now introduce. So um, we, we look at a very, a very uh, we split our time interval into very small intervals and consider the probability that our path stays close to F in one of these intervals. And the coupling we build involves three processes that all start from the point at which Xi starts at the beginning of the interval and that are, are built as follows. So Z will be a process which has the same distribution as Xi and Z minus and Z plus can trap it and have constant rates. So we will be able to carry out calculations by translating the probability involving Xi into a probability involving Z, which is trapped between Z minus and Z plus. And, and, and we do this as follows. So we consider our X and our minus, our X plus and our X minus to be the biggest and smallest possible rate along the X component that you can take both in space and time. So for all the functions that are near F and for all the times in our small interval. And then we build two processes that have the maximum rate in X, so X plus, and Y plus, which has the maximum rate in Y. And these two processes are independent. Then let's focus first on the X component. We build the, the, the X components of Z and the process X minus in such a way that their jumps are subsets of X, the jumps of X plus, and in such a way that these two processes have the right rate. So Z will have rate Rx of Z and X minus rate Rx minus, which is the smallest rate along X we can have in that interval. So this is building the X jumps in such a way that Z has the right amount of jumps that also Xi has, and X minus and X plus have one the smallest possible number of jumps and one the highest possible number of jumps. So we will be sure that the X component of Z is trapped between the two X plus and X minus processes. And we do the same with the Y component. So these construction, constructions also gives independence properties in the sense that the X's and the Y's are independent between each other, and they have some, <laughs> some independence in between them. So um, it will be possible to translate the probability involving Xi into a probability that only involves X and Y plus and minus and we'll be able to carry out the calculation. I don't want to get into the detail of this particular formula. It has different forms that basically depend on whether the X plus and minus overshoot or underestimate the maximum distance they can travel within the ball around F. And then the conclusion is that we, can, we have these weird exponents, but we can approximate them with a nice formula, which is the integral of this square term. Um, and, and this is exactly the large deviation function we would get when the, if the rate was constant. So if you look at the exponential distribution and the branching, around, uh, sorry, a random walk with constant rate, then this is the large deviation function. And of course, we need to do this for both the X and Y component. So putting the results together, we get that the expected number of particles following F is given by k, which is the functional that appeared in the main theorem I stated, and is represented by the integral of the rate function, which came from the many to one lemma, minus j, which is the functional that comes from the large deviation, the slide before this one. So it's the sum of the rate we get for the x and the y component. Now, the way the proof goes overall, 
uh, is quite standard for the upper bound in the sense that we can apply Markov's inequality and then get the almost sure result with borel cantelis lemma. Uh, and we apply a second moment method. So the calculations I've shown you for the first moment can also be carried out for the second moment. And the, the general structure of the lower bound involves uh, is quite standard. So it usually involves letting the system run for a while and looking at an early generation. Then you look at the descendants of all particles in this early generation, and you show that each one of them has a large enough number of descendants close to F. And then you take advantage of the fact that in that early generation, there is an exponentially large number of particles. So the problem for us is this one. So showing that there are enough particles in an early generation, which is difficult because the rate is discontinuous at the origin. So the way we get around this is by defining a particular function and showing that there are particles near that function. And this is built as follow, follows. So um, this is a, a good function. So the rate is bounded and it's piecewise linear. So it starts by being a straight line. And this is because if we think of the analogy of the branching ground walk with the fragmentation process, squares are a preferred shape for fragmenting rectangles. And being a square corresponds to following a straight line in the branching ground walk. So by taking advantage of this, we'll be able to show that there's a large number of particles that follows this straight line up to some small times. And then we, we, we build this function, function H so that it shifts it, its gradient towards the gradient of F. This also happens up to a small time. And after that small time, H is equal to F. So while we do this, we also need to make sure that H is closing up to F and that the functional evaluated at H doesn't change too much compared to the functional evaluated at F. But the most important property is that the functional stays positive at all times along H. So this is a non-extinction condition along H. So, um, and, and this last condition is the most difficult one. So the way we do it is by showing that in the, in the set of possible drifts, there exists a path from a half a half, which is the initial rate of H, to lambda mu, which is the drift of F at small times. And we can build a path along which K always stays positive. And you can do this by changing your drift while still being a straight line or only changing one of the two components in your drift. Okay, so to conclude with, let me briefly mention that there is still uh, an open question which concerns the optimal paths. So our theorem shows that almost shortly, you can determine at least mathematically the number of particles that end at a given position. So if you fix Z and Y, the number of particles that end near Z and Y is the supremum of K for all the functions that end at that endpoint. So, um, we don't know how to solve this optimization problem, although uh, it is possible that there are some, some intuitions behind this. For example, a similar problem has been considered in a branching ground motion model where the rates were spatially dependent. So the rates here are a power of the position of the particles. So the farther you are from the origin, the faster you split. And the optimal paths in this, uh, in this model are the blue lines, whereas the red line is the rightmost part so here the optimal paths follow the rightmost particle up to some point and then they move away and in some cases it's even possible to determine that they follow a second order differential equation. So uh, it would be interesting to, to see if there's an analogy in our model, although we don't have a clear understanding at the moment of what happens. And of course our setting is much more complicated because BBM is in continuous, uh, with continuous functions and we have discontinuous and the problem is also two-dimensional. Okay, I will stop here and if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much for your talk. So uh, are there some uh, questions? Yeah, I see a question from Pascal. Uh, yeah, th thanks so much. So if I understand right, um, so you, in order to apply the second moment method, so you truncate your paths uh, to be in that cone, right? 
So um, did I understand it right? So it's, yes. it's basically in order to be able to apply a second format method. Uh, well, we exclude paths that are that are too high or too low because in that way right. you can reduce to a finite number of functions. Otherwise, you, you're not able to cover any set. Right, and um, so th and this is especially necessary for the lower bound, right? Uh, no, for the upper bound as well. For the upper bound as well. Okay. Um, all right, and uh, my second question was. Um, uh, so suppose you bias your splitting in the other way, so you you tend to thin the rectangles. Mm -hmm. um, would the proof again work? Uh, no, not well, not immediate, immediately. The first problem is that we really do use that squares are the preferred shape. So if you do the opposite, um, mm -hmm. I mean. I expect criticalities to appear everywhere, and and I also wouldn't know how to extend that argument that that you tend to be a square, even for other rate functions, really, even though they're not okay. crazy. Like your example could be really crazy, but even okay. with nicer ones, there might be some parts of the proof that do not extend immediately. Okay, good. Thanks. So I see a question from Luigi as well. Thanks, yes. Uh, thanks for the very interesting talk. I'm curious if you can say anything about uh, the partition of mass that you get of the unit square at a given time. Like if you, if you say, for example, you put, um, you just uh, looked at the measure that you get by choosing, uh, correspond to the experiment of sampling a uniformly random rectangle at time t, what, the, what that measure looks like asymptotically. I, I don't know. I, I haven't looked at it and I don't know. Thanks. So maybe if I can ask a quick question. So do you have sense of um, something that would be equivalent to the, to the largest displacement or, or smallest displacement in the analogous branching order model? Like, so the, the size of the smallest uh, of the square of the rectangle with largest area or the size of the, the, the shape of the rectangle with the smallest area, for example? Well, not really. So at some point I conjecture them to be squares, but I don't think that's true. <laughs> okay. So th that, that's what surprises me. So I, I used to think that, yeah, the smallest and the biggest one would be, would be squares, but we, we ran some simulations and, and, and then the optimization problem gave unpredictable answers and in an unpredictable way. So I don't really, I it's, see. It's, so, really it's really not clear to me. But, but would you expect the, the existence of some kind of uh, decorated Poisson point process with uh, rectangles of similar shape? Or how, how does it organize? Uh, do, do you have a sense on how, how does the the shapes organize with one another? Yeah, that's another problem because I think it's possible that you get some, some very bad splits at the start, which really influence your behavior afterwards. So um, that also makes the number of particles go crazy, right? Because if you get, it, it changes massively if you run the simulations and you split soon in the middle or you just take away a tiny portion of your area. So, um, I, I don't know. It feels like a few splits could really change the overall configuration. OK, thank you very much. So unless there is one last question, I don't see any. So well, let's all thanks again, Alice, for her, her very nice talk. So thank you very much. And so now we have uh, another 15 minute break in the Gazelton area, if you wish. And I'll and, uh, try not to after, break after the that. Zoom room. Sorry? Yes, so I'll, I'll try not to break the Zoom room. Oh, right. Yeah. And Pascal will uh, let you in if you, <laughs> if possible. Actually, that was my fault last time. <laughs> yeah, I, I appointed you co-host, right? But well, <laughs> let, let's the last, person, it's right last person's fault, but uh, that's, <laughs> well, that's I'm a bit unfair. I'm pointing the finger at me, so. <laughs> So actually, I am now 
I'll try to switch to my iPad. So my iPad uh, is uh, is still in there and then I can go together mm -hmm. to run with my computer. I'll try Sounds to see. <laughs>